Tasty is challenging me to create a three course meal for four guests for $20. The great thing about this one is this thing came in at $2.21. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm the test kitchen manager here at Tasty. And after a long day of working in the kitchen, there's nothing I like more than sitting down for a meal with my wife. But ordering in and going out can be a little bit expensive. So today, I'm challenging myself to make five weeknight meals for two for only $20. All right. So I was able to find everything that I needed at the store for $18.76, which means I came in under budget. So the dishes I'm gonna be making are a sweet potato and chickpea curry, a one pot chicken fajita rice bake, and to close out the week, I'm gonna make my favorite thing, chicken piccata. So instead of having five meals for five nights, I'm gonna stretch my budget a little bit more and have two meals twice, and then end out the week with something a little bit special. And helping me out today are gonna to be a few pantry staples, which I also recommend that you have in your own home. Those are butter, olive oil, salt, and pepper. And with all that said, it's time to start cooking. Okay, so first thing I have to do is break down this whole chicken, which it looks a little intimidating, but it's actually a lot easier than you think. And very inexpensive. You wanna lay it down with the legs facing you. You'll take your knife and make an incision in the skin right here between the breast and the leg. It should just come apart really easy. Now do the same thing on the other side. The leg joints are exposed, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my hands underneath here and then I'm gonna pop the thighs right out of the socket. I wanna take my knife and I wanna cut right on the opposite side of that closest to the breast, very carefully. Obviously use a sharp knife when you're doing this. It makes everything easier. So here you have your chicken leg. You have your thigh and your drumstick. Now, same thing with the other one. Find the ball joint, get in there with your knife carefully, and there you have both separated. So I'm gonna set this aside just over here. I'm gonna bring the legs back to my board, turn them around, and you'll see right here, there's this fat line. That's the exact place you wanna cut and separate the leg and the thigh. And you'll actually feel it with your knife and just go straight through, one leg, one thigh. So now I'm gonna focus on the white meat. The easiest way to get the breast off the chicken, you have your breast plate here. What you wanna do is you wanna cut on the opposite side of that closest to the breast you wanna remove and just make a small incision. This part is all about the small incisions, getting as much meat as possible. That's obviously the goal, we wanna stretch our budget. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep going down. I'm literally just riding along the rib cage. Trim back any of this fat from the skin that you don't need. Remove this breast, go through the skin. It's all about small strokes. And there, you have one chicken breast. The other one, same thing. Ride the rib cage when you can. Trim back any of this fat. Cut around the wing. There you go, two chicken breasts. All right, so my chicken is broken down. And the nice thing about this is I'm gonna be able to use all these parts of the chicken in different dishes to really stretch my budget. But I'm not gonna discard this carcass. This is gonna become a delicious chicken stock. Our chicken stock is really just gonna be chicken, salt, pepper, and water. You could use aromatics if you want, onions, carrots, celery. Most chicken stocks have them, but since it isn't in our budget, we have to work with what we have. So I add the chicken to the pot, then I'm gonna add water just to cover, a pinch of salt, a couple cracks of fresh pepper. We're gonna let this come to a boil, bring it down to a simmer, and let it simmer for about four hours to extract as much chicken flavor as possible. Guess I'll see you guys in about four hours. So what I want to do is strain this out, get all the chicken bits out, and just have a nice clean stock. Be careful once all the pieces come out. Let's taste it. It's actually really nice. I'm just going to add a little bit more salt just for myself. Stock is all strained out. It's seasoned to my liking. I'm going to use this in the majority of my cooking today. Whatever's left over, I'll keep in my fridge for a week, and then I'll throw it in the freezer if I don't get around to it. So now it's time to dive into our first recipe. First thing I'm gonna make is a sweet potato and chickpea curry. This is gonna be enough for two dinners for the two of us. So first thing we wanna do, get our heat going. Let's go over medium heat. We'll add some olive oil. So once your oil is nice and warm and shimmering, we're gonna add in some diced onion. I'm gonna give this a stir just to get the onions all coated in the olive oil. I'm gonna season it with a little bit of salt just because I like to season every step of the way. It's guaranteed excellent flavor. But we don't want the onions to burn, we just want them to sweat out a little bit and soften just to bring out their natural flavors. 
While those are cooking, I'm gonna grate some fresh ginger right into the pot. Most people think you have to peel the ginger, but I find that it's a bit of a taxing step, so we're just gonna grate it straight in. I'm gonna give this a stir, get those flavors all together. Looks like our onions are good to go. What I wanna do now is I wanna add in some freshly minced garlic. Again, just adding extra flavor, give it a stir. You just wanna cook it until it's fragrant. You don't wanna burn it, it'll get really bitter. Nobody likes that. So now we're gonna add in our curry powder. What we're doing is we're toasting the curry powder. We're really drawing out that flavor and making the flavors really warm. Now it's gonna taste good the first day, but the leftovers are gonna taste even better. When these flavors have had time to marry and sit in the fridge together, mm, there's nothing better than that. The curry is nice and toasted. So what I wanna do now is add everything else. So we have our chickpeas for a little bit of protein and we have our sweet potatoes. I'm gonna season. All right, so we're gonna get these vegetables coated in that beautifully toasted curry powder. And now I'm gonna add some coconut milk. Give that a stir. I'm gonna do a little seasoning. And next we're gonna take this delicious chicken stock that we already made. We're gonna add this right in here. Now, we're using chicken stock because we want it to stretch the chicken and, and save our budget, but if you do have it in the budget to buy some vegetable stock, this would be a wonderful vegetarian dish. We're gonna bring this to a boil. We're gonna reduce it down to a simmer. Let it simmer for about 15 minutes until the sweet potatoes are perfectly cooked through. Well, my curry is simmering away. I'm actually gonna toast some extra curry powder just to add a little extra flavor so we can get some curry in a hurry. We have our heat, our oil, just a little bit. So now the oil's nice and hot. I'm gonna add in our curry powder and we're just gonna carefully toast this until it starts to smell fragrant and nutty. Like I said, this is gonna add so much curry flavor to this already delicious curry. This will happen really quick too, so don't even blink. It's safe to say that that is smelling fragrant and delicious and it's ready to get added to our curry. Now I'm gonna add in some spinach and I'm just gonna cook it for about two minutes till it gets nice and wilted. Careful when adding this in. It's gonna look like a lot, but it's gonna shrink down to nothing. And then just to finish this off a little bit, I'm gonna add a little bit of acid. So I'm gonna add some lime juice. All right, this looks really good. I have two Tupperware containers here full of cooked rice. Rice is really inexpensive and I'm also gonna use it in another dish I'm making today. If you wanna check out our Tasty 101 video on how to cook rice, click below. So what I'm gonna do is I'll spoon my curry over the rice, do it over the pot. Curry will stain your countertop. This is gonna be really, really good in a couple days. So I'm gonna let these cool. I'm gonna transfer them to the refrigerator for later on in the week. The rest of this I'll heat up later on when my wife comes to try. Let's move on to the next recipe. The next recipe we're gonna do is a one pot chicken and pajita rice bake. This recipe is really nice because we can use the majority of the chicken that we already broke down and then we can use the other half of the rice that we didn't use during the curry recipe. And like with the curry, this is gonna cover two meals during the week. I'm just gonna add a little bit of our olive oil. You're gonna wanna use enough to just coat a nice thin layer on the bottom of the pan. So season our chicken, salt and pepper on both sides. So we'll flip it over with some tongs. We're gonna use two of the drumsticks two of the thighs, and one of the chicken breast. The other chicken breast we're gonna save for our uh, final dish of the week. We're just gonna use a store-bought packet of fajita seasoning. I'm gonna use about a third of it to season the chicken, and then I'll use the remainder of it later on in the dish. Same thing, we'll go in on both sides. We really wanna get as much flavor out of this as possible. And these fajita spice packets, I grew up on these things. Everything my mother made had a spice packet, whether it be tacos or chili. Okay, so now I'm gonna rub the chicken. Get all those spices into it. Get under the skin if you can. Any excess spices on the sheet tray, you can just pat right onto there. Just wanna make sure we're getting every inch of this delicious chicken that you spent all the time breaking down, coated with the spice. If you have any extra left over, just do the same thing, dump it on. We'll really get it in there. Our chicken is all seasoned. It's time to sear it up. So I'm gonna add everything in skin side down just so we can get that nice crispy skin. You could use skinless chicken thighs, but I just really, really love crispy chicken skin. And a lot of the fat is gonna drip down into the rice, which is gonna make it taste so good. Evenly spaced apart, you don't wanna crowd the pan too much. So I'm gonna let this go for about two to three minutes per side, just till it gets nice and golden brown. We'll flip it over and then we'll finish off the dish. I'm just gonna take a little peek under the chicken just to make sure it's getting nice and brown, not burning. If it starts to burn, you can move it around the pan. Every pan kind of has a different hot spot, so cool, oh, we're almost there. You don't really have to worry about cooking the chicken through at this point. You're really just getting some color on the skin. It adds a lot of flavor, cooks out a lot of those spices. A lot of the cooking is gonna happen a little later on in the recipe. Our chicken is nice and golden brown on one side. Oh, that's perfect. 
So we're just going to do the same thing on the other side, let it go for about two to three minutes. I'm going to go ahead and take it out of the pan, transfer it to a nice clean sheet tray. I know you can't smell it, but this smells so good. And you don't have to tell anybody it's a fajita packet. Our chicken's done, so I'm going to finish off the rest of the dish. We're going to start with our vegetables, sliced onion and green bell peppers. Green is actually the cheapest one in the store, so that's what we're working with today. We've already built all the flavor in the pan. You've got chicken juices, you've got some of the flavor from that. I'm just going to add the vegetables to our pan. We're going to season with salt. And then we're just going to cook these down until they're nice and soft in about two to three minutes. We don't have to worry about cooking these all the way through because it's going to finish off in the oven. Let's give them a nice toss, get it all coated in that already built flavor in the pan. So while these onions sweat, they're going to release a lot of their natural juices, which is going to pick up a lot of that really nice flavor in the pan. So to these vegetables, I'm going to add about a cup and a half of rice. I like to add the rice in at this step just so it toasts a little bit, gets a little bit of nutty, also adds extra flavor. And then to this, I'm gonna add the remainder of that fajita packet I was talking about earlier. Give that a stir, get everything coated. So once all the rice is nice and coated in the spices, we're gonna add in our homemade chicken stock. We're gonna go in with about two and a quarter cups of this chicken stock. Give it a mix, let it come to a little simmer, scrape off the bottom of the pan if there's any nice browned bits. All right. This is simmering, so I'm gonna go ahead and add our chicken pieces back in. So I'm just gonna nestle these in here just to make sure that it cooks all the way through. Oh, and don't forget all these beautiful juices. So I turned off the heat. I'm gonna go ahead and cover this with some foil. A fun little trick, to make sure the foil gets nice and tight, pinch the bottom and twist. All right, and this is good to go. We're gonna transfer it to a 400 degree oven for 35 to 40 minutes until the internal temperature of the chicken is 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my God. That looks so good. I'm gonna take half of this and I'm gonna save it for later on in the week. Let's get the thighs. My favorite cut of the chicken. That should be enough and then we'll get some of this delicious rice and vegetable situation. Oh, it smells so good. I don't know if I can wait until later on in the week. So when it's time to serve, I also bought sour cream, salsa, and some lime to really jazz up the flavors a little bit. All right, I'll serve this later when Claire comes here and now we're ready to move on to our final recipe our final dish of the week, one of my all-time favorites, chicken piccata. So first things first, we gotta tackle this lemon. I always say when life gives you lemons, make chicken piccata. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut this lemon in half crosswise. I'm gonna cut this guy in half. These guys I'm just gonna cut into really thin slices, about an eighth of an inch thick. So a little trick when you're cutting any vegetable or fruit is to just keep your hand in a nice claw formation. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna transfer these to a really small bowl. These are gonna go into our sauce later on in the dish. And the juice of this is actually gonna go into our sauce later on as well. So that's our lemon. Now we're gonna move on to the chicken. We have our last chicken breast here. You're probably wondering why do you have one chicken breast? How's this gonna make two meals? We're actually gonna go ahead and cut this in half and it's gonna make two thinner chicken breasts. So to take off the skin, you don't have to do anything fancy. You can really just peel it back, use some force and and voila. So to get two cutlets out of this one chicken breast, you wanna take your knife, you wanna use your other hand as force, and then really thin strokes through the center of this chicken breast, making sure that we get all the pieces. You can kinda of see, you can open it up this way and then slowly slice away at it. So you get two perfect chicken cutlets. One and two. We're gonna pound these out really thin. It helps the chicken cook a little bit faster and it's also very traditional to chicken piccata. I'm gonna take one large piece of plastic wrap and I'm gonna place it over top of these chicken breasts. With the flat end of the meat mallet, we're just gonna pound away at these chicken breasts. What I like to do is instead of going directly down, I like to almost go in an upward motion. And I would say you're looking for these chicken cutlets to be about a quarter of an inch thick. This may seem like a really small amount for two people, but it's gonna be over a bed of pasta. It's gonna have a really delicious and buttery sauce, so you'll be all good. So I'm just gonna season it with salt and pepper, give it a little flip and dip, a little sprinkle, a little pepper. I'm so excited for this. This is literally one of my favorite dishes. I put some oil in the pan. We have to dredge our chicken in a little bit of flour. So we used all-purpose flour here, very inexpensive at the store. And I'm gonna add this to the pan. Lay the chicken cutlet down away from you so the oil doesn't splatter. And get this guy nice and coated. And now we're gonna cook these for two to two and a half minutes per side, get nice and golden brown. Then we'll flip, do the same thing, and then we're on to our sauce. All right, our chicken is done. Nice and golden brown on both sides. Just gonna transfer this to a clean plate with a pair of clean tongs. All right, so it's time to make our sauce. Into the same pan, we're gonna use all the chicken drippings as our oil. We're gonna cook some garlic, about two cloves of garlic. We just want to cook that until fragrant. We don't want it to burn. We're already starting to brown, so I'm going to add in our capers. The capers are nice and briny to add a nice salty note to this chicken piccata, also one of the classic ingredients in the sauce. 
I'm gonna add in our lemon slices. These are gonna cook down and release their juices naturally. So when your garlic starts to get a little too golden brown, we're gonna add in our chicken stock. This will stop the cooking. It'll also bring out a lot of the flavors. Lemon is the very iconic flavor in chicken piccata, so just to really drive that home a little bit, I'm gonna add some freshly squeezed lemon juice. So we're just gonna let this cook down for a couple minutes until it's reduced by half. So the thing about chicken piccata and me is this is actually the first thing I actually learned how to make. I think I just kind of always gear towards the lemon flavor of things. I really love super acidic things, so when I first learned how to cook, I was like, that's the first thing I'm gonna learn how to do. So the sauce is reduced down by half. I'm just gonna turn off the heat, and then we're gonna add our butter. So this is about two tablespoons of butter. Ideally, a nice cold pat of butter. And what I like to do is I actually like to swirl it into the sauce. This way it gradually just kind of thickens the sauce, stops it from breaking. I can smell the capers, the garlic's really coming through. You can see how creamy and emulsified that butter is in the sauce. It's really, really nice. All right, that looks perfect. Our sauce is done. It's exactly where I want it to be. Just to add a little bit of color, I'm gonna throw in some fresh chopped parsley. Save a little bit for garnish too. Turn off the heat, and now it's time to plate it all up. I'm gonna serve it over pasta. Pasta really hearty, super inexpensive. So pasta on the plate, and then I just wanna gently place the chicken breast over top, like so, and then use our delicious sauce. Spoon all of that over top. This is also gonna become a sauce for the pasta too. Make sure we get it right on nice on top there. I'm gonna put more capers on mine because I love capers. I'm just gonna finish it off with a little bit more fresh parsley just for some color. And that's it, the final plate of the week. We did it. We've got everything plated up. We've got five weeknight meals for two for just under $20. Now all that's left to do is to have Claire come in and try it. Mmm, that's delicious. Hearty enough for... Oh yeah. And you could eat this two days out of the week. Done. We have a one pot chicken fajita uh, rice bake. Perfect. All right. Ooh, good color. Thanks. You taught me that. I don't know what I'm talking about. Good? Yeah, that's really good. Wow, that chicken is cooked perfectly. This is like our first four days. Okay. And then finally, on Friday, I made you my favorite, <laughs> which is the chicken piccata. Ah, Italian. Makes sense. Mmm. Good, right? Oh my god. Hi, I'm Ayo, and I'm a private chef. Typically, when I work for clients, I have a really big or unlimited budget, but Tasty is challenging me to create a three-course meal for four guests for $20, which honestly feels like a little bit of a setup. Wish me luck. So for the first course, I'm gonna set my oven to 425, and I'm actually going to crisp up this prosciutto I found for $4. So we have a nice crunchy topping that gives our tartine some depth and some texture. Next, I got the bread for $1, and I'm gonna make the base of the tartine by covering both sides of the bread in olive oil and also toasting it in the oven with the prosciutto to save time. So the prosciutto is gonna go in the oven for about six minutes, and the toast are gonna go in the oven for anywhere between seven to 10 10 minutes. While those are in the oven, we're gonna make our whipped lemon ricotta. First, we're gonna put the ricotta into the food processor. A lot of food processors need some kind of liquid or something in the bottom to get them going, so I'm gonna add my tablespoon of olive oil pretty close to the blade. Good, good, good tip is to use one ingredient twice. So for this step, I'm actually only gonna use the zest of this lemon, and I'll use the juice later. So I'm gonna add a little salt, and then I'm gonna start this bad boy. Oh. I'm actually gonna let this sit for a second and move on to getting my zucchini ready for our presentation. I'm actually gonna create zucchini ribbons, which will give us a little height too. And this is what you want for your peel. So I'm gonna season these with pepper and I'm gonna add a little salt because everything needs a little salt and just a hint of olive oil because it's gonna make them easier to twirl. And basically you're just gonna give it a little toss. It doesn't need a lot. And you wanna be really gentle with them because you can overwork the zucchini and then they just get watery and they get really flat. And we wanna keep that crunch and that height. I'm gonna go get my toast and my prosciutto and let's put together course number one. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do with your hot bread is rub it with the fresh garlic cloves. And I know if you've never done this, it's like, what? But this gives it so much flavor. Hold on tight to the garlic and keep rubbing it. And you wanna do that to all of them, both sides. We're gonna take about two tablespoons of ricotta and just scoop a big dollop right in the middle. And I know some chefs and foodies are like, that looks a hot mess. I know, that is why we have this. And I'm actually just gonna create some nice little hills and valleys for my zucchini to live in. All right, so our next step is definitely like the showstopper of this course. 
So what you're gonna do for your ribbons, take a little piece, you can wrap it around a finger or a pair of tweezers if you're that kind of chef and you have them. You just slide it off. You just wanna create a little ribbon. And when you put it down, it just stays. And basically we're gonna do that two to three more times for each toast. We're gonna take half of one piece of our prosciutto and we're just gonna give it a little crumble. And once you have a couple little pieces, you're just gonna lightly sprinkle them over your zucchini toast. So after the prosciutto, we're gonna top it with some parsley. So the parsley is pretty much our last step. So I'm just gonna salt and pepper it and then we can move on to our main course. And the great thing about this one is this thing came in at $2.21. I honestly couldn't believe it. So for my chicken filling, I have a half a cup of spinach, a cup of shredded mozzarella cheese, and a little bit of minced garlic, about one clove. Okay, so I've mixed up our filling. We're just gonna set this aside and we're gonna start pounding out this chicken. When you're pounding out chicken, two very important things. Plastic wrap. You want one on the bottom and one on the top. And basically this is just gonna protect your chicken from flying everywhere. It's gonna protect everything around you. When you're pounding it out, you wanna get it about a quarter of an inch thick. And if you do get a hole or two, don't worry about it because that is what the prosciutto is here for. It's a really great stress reliever too. All right, and I think we are about there. I'm actually gonna go ahead and season my chicken thigh. And I use the thigh because thighs are always much cheaper than breast. So our chicken is seasoned and pounded out. I'm gonna get a new piece of plastic wrap and lay two pieces of prosciutto down. I'm just gonna lay my chicken down inside the prosciutto. And then we're gonna add our filling. And I'm gonna make sure I create a thin layer all across so you get an equal amount of cheese and spinach in one bite. Tuck your thumbs under the bottom and you just create a nice tight roll all the way. And if you get a little filling on the side, you know, just shove it back in. Everyone's gonna go together. The good thing about putting the plastic wrap down first is we're already ready. So I'm actually gonna take the end furthest away from me and just really tightly roll her up. And what this does is gets the chicken kind of used to being in this shape and it makes it a lot easier when it comes time to sear it. We're searing them so we can help the prosciutto get crispy. We're gonna lock in our moisture before we put it in the oven. And I'm gonna create a little bit of fond at the bottom of the pan, which basically means we're gonna get a little bit of brown bits so when we deglaze it to make our sauce, it'll have a little bit of the meat flavor, which just helps tie the whole dish together. So this is what we want. This is golden brown delicious. Since I got that on one side, I'm just gonna turn them so I can keep getting all my sides nice and brown. So these are about ready. I actually added some toothpicks because they started to unroll a little bit. So I'm gonna take these out and transfer them to this pan so we can put them in the oven for about 15 to 20 minutes at 400 degrees. So now we're gonna make our sauce. We're gonna slice our peppers. So what you're gonna do is just split it in half down the middle. You wanna remove the seeds and the membranes because when we create our red pepper sauce, they're just gonna make it gritty. So roasting the pepper is a really good idea for this sauce because it's gonna give us a ton of flavor. It completely changes the flavor profile of the pepper for very, very little money. So let's go broil these for two to three minutes. Once the skin is nice and black, it's time for them to come out. So my peppers are done. I put them in this bowl and wrap them so it steams them and that skin is just going to melt off. We're gonna blend this so you don't really need it to be like a nice chop. To create more depth of flavor, first we're gonna saute this pepper. We're also gonna add two cloves of minced garlic smells great. So now I'm going to deglaze this with our lemon juice. So when we just say deglaze, it literally means pick up all the brown bits or anything that could be stuck to the pan. So I have a cup and a half of chicken broth. I'm going to add that to my sauce before we get to blending. All right, so this looks ready. So I'm just going to pour it in the blender. So I'm going to go ahead and add this back to our pan. And I know this feels like a lot of steps for a sauce, but to me, the sauce is the most important part. So now we're just gonna let this come up to a boil and we're gonna turn it down a little so it doesn't boil over, but you do want it to reduce by about half. So this is reduced, so I think we're good to go. The only thing we're missing for this is something to give it like that luxurious feel, which is where the butter comes in. So I'm going to add this very, very cold butter, about a tablespoon, a tablespoon and a half at a time, because you do not want to break your sauce. For this dish, I'm using fettuccine, so basically, I'm just gonna give it a nice little twirl in the sauce. All right, let's see what this inside looks like. Oh, that that is sexy. So as you can see, when I get into my pasta, I just start creating like just a little twirl. And I'm just gonna put it directly in the center and just drop it. And because we spent all that time making these pretty rolls, we're gonna stagger them so you can see all of the pieces. 
All we need is a little Italian parsley. And finally, we're gonna put some fresh cracked black pepper over the top. And that's our main course. Surprisingly, it came in at 189 per serving and it looks amazing. I'm excited, so let's go ahead and start on dessert. The first thing I'm gonna do is take a teaspoon and a half of this gelatin and I'm just gonna add the gelatin to the water. And then we're gonna let it sit for about five minutes. So while that's happening, we're gonna add our half and half and our sugar. And then I'm just gonna give it a little stir while I bring it up just under a boil. I'm gonna add our gelatin to it and I'm just gonna keep stirring. So now we're gonna strain it, and it's just to make sure we don't get any little bits of gelatin or anything, and make sure it has a nice creamy mouthfeel. Once our cream has cooled down a little bit, I'm gonna add it to our cups. They're gonna sit at a really cool angle. Just another little plating treat to make them look a little fancier than they actually are. I have a pound of thawed frozen strawberries and I'm gonna add them to my pan. And with them, I'm going to add a quarter cup of sugar and a half a cup of water. I'm gonna do this until they come up just under a boil till they have a nice bubble to them until some of the water comes out of the strawberries. And we're just gonna puree it. Oh, it smells so good, it's beautiful. So I'm just gonna put this back. We're gonna keep it warm because we're gonna add back in our gelatin. All right, this is good to go, so I'm gonna go ahead and strain it. Got some chunky bits, some seeds, all the things from the strawberries, so I think we got it all out and we are ready to set. I've transferred my strawberry puree to a measuring cup and I'm just gonna pour it over the white bars. You need to let this cool a little bit. You don't wanna do it while it's hot. So I'm gonna let these sit for two to four hours and hope that I was able to make this pretty and tasty because that's really the true test of this, right? It needs to taste good and not like it costs $20. All right, that's our strawberry panna cotta. Came in at 106 per serving, which is insane. Like, I think it's beautiful. So for $20, I was able to create a super seasonal tartine. There's a roasted red pepper sauce. I wrapped my chicken in the same prosciutto. And finally, we made this awesome panna cotta. I'm actually really proud of this, you guys. I think I did a pretty good job. Okay, this is really good. <laughs> I cannot believe this was a dollar and six cents. It tastes like we really put some effort forth. Like we, like me and y'all, we did this together. Hey guys, it's Katie and this is my husband, Chris. Hi. And today we've got a new challenge. Ooh. I am gonna try to make a gourmet dessert shopping only at the dollar store. Wow. It had eggs, it had cream cheese, butter, cake pans, and I now have a plan. I'm gonna make a cheesecake with a strawberry topping and a coconut cookie crust. And then on top of that, I'm gonna have Italian meringue, sugar shards, candy, crushed up cookies. So let's just get right into it. First thing I'm gonna do is make the coconut cookie crust for the bottom of our cheesecake. Take about 16 of them and put them through the food processor and grind them up till they're nice and fine. If you have a small food processor like mine, you'll have to do this in batches. Add this to a small bowl and three tablespoons of melted butter. Mix that up until it becomes a nice wet sand texture. And then I've lined an eight by eight cake band with cooking spray and parchment paper. Add our crust to the bottom. Make sure you get this nice and compacted. That way it really sticks together once it sets in the fridge because this is gonna be a no-bake cheesecake. This looks nice and even, so now we're gonna move on to making the filling. I got a classic cheesecake mix from the dollar store and the instructions are really easy. So all we need to do is add the mix to a bowl and then eight ounces of cream cheese. Beat this until it's smooth and creamy. Now we're gonna fold in our whipped topping. All right, that looks pretty good. Add this to our cake pan. And then use an offset spatula to smooth it out and make it nice and even. I'm gonna put this in the fridge and move on to our next step. Okay, and for our final element of the actual cheesecake, we're gonna make a strawberry topping. Now they didn't have fresh strawberries at this dollar store I went to, but they did have strawberry jello. So the first thing we need to do is combine one packet with three quarters cup boiling water. Mix that together until the sugar dissolves. I'm doing the speed set method, which you then add cold water and ice. And this is just quickly bringing down the temperature of the jello so it sets faster. Stir that till the mixture thickens up, then remove any leftover ice with a slotted spoon. I'm gonna use a ladle to gently spoon on the jello mixture to the cheesecake. I wanna make a thin layer, not a big thick one. I think I ended up using about a half of the jello mixture. Make sure wherever you put this in your fridge is very flat so that you don't have like more jello in one area. 
don't want that. So the next few things we're gonna make are gonna be the garnishes that go on top of our cheesecake. We're gonna measure out about a quarter cup of sugar and add two tablespoons of water. I'm gonna swirl that around a bit just so that all of the sugar meets the water, they get acquainted. Put that over medium heat and let that go until it reaches 240 degrees Fahrenheit. While that heats up, we're gonna whip up one egg white at room temperature. You'll beat this egg white until you get soft peaks. We've got soft peaks. Let's take the temperature. Okay, we're at 240. So with your beaters on, we're gonna slowly pour in the sugar. And then you're gonna turn the mixer up to high. Our meringue is done, it's sticking to the bowl. Next thing I'm gonna make are candy glass shards. First thing we'll do is add half a cup of sugar to a saucepan and then a quarter cup of water. So we're gonna heat this up somewhere between 295 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. We wanna get it to the hard crack stage, like hard candy, like a Jolly Rancher. So you can add food coloring to your candy to get different colors, but I'm gonna go for a more natural look and get that golden brown caramel color. All right, I think we're there, so we're just gonna pour this on some parchment I have. Ooh, oh yeah. While it's still warm, you're gonna tilt your pan up and down and around to try to spread this out. We don't want thick, hard glass. We want like thin, delicate shards. Once it's cool, take something heavy like a meat mallet or a fork or a spoon and you can start hitting it. Just get out any aggression that you need to get out. But just hit it and all these cracks are gonna form. And then it should just peel right off and then you have these nice little glass pieces. The last thing I'm gonna do is make a coulis, which is a French term for basically a fruit or vegetable puree that's used as a sauce on the plate. And I feel like every gourmet dish has it. So I'm gonna make my coulis with strawberry jam. And I'm gonna measure out two tablespoons, then add one teaspoon of water. And we'll mix that right up. And then to make sure there's no clumps in it, run it through a fine mesh strainer. All right, looks good. All of our elements are ready to go. The only thing left to do is assemble this bad boy. I'm gonna use a white plate for this because it's a blank canvas and the colors are really gonna pop off of it. I'm taking my coolie and a pastry brush and I am gonna paint the bottom of the plate. Next, we're gonna place a thin slice of cheesecake in the middle. We'll just tuck in anything that fell. We'll clean up those crumbs. I'll top that with crushed wafer cookies, crushed freezer dried strawberries. I'm gonna add a couple pieces of candy then we'll take our candy glass and put that on top and then pipe on some meringue. My meringue is not as stiff as I want, but I still think it looks pretty. We just have to keep going. So that's what we're gonna do. Last but not least, I'm gonna add some coconut pieces. We'll finish this off by adding some more on the plate. And last thing we need to do is clean it. Chris! Here it is. Whoa! Oh my God, that looks like something from a fancy restaurant. And you're not saying that because you're married to me. No, no, it looks really good. It, if it didn't, I would say it looked like trash. Trash! I really want to taste it. All right, let's try it. All right. Mmm. 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 Oh, it's really good. Ooh. This gore makes the grade. Whoa! <laughs> Okay, we came in under budget. Multiple stores, a few hacks here and there, but I was able to get everything I needed for my Thanksgiving dinner for $29.93. I have a few pantry staples that I can use today to help me out. I have olive oil and I have salt and pepper. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I got a few tips and tricks. I kinda have a plan, but let's get started. I'm gonna start with dessert because I'm gonna show you how to save time and show you how to save some money. So I am going to make a cheater's meringue for a patty pie. I'm using a patty pie because I wanna kinda stay true to my roots with this. So I'm going to start with a pre-made patty pie. To jazz up this pie a little, I'm actually gonna make a cheater's meringue. So I have three room temperature egg whites, marshmallow fluff, and I'm gonna whip this up into soft peaks and then slowly add in my marshmallow fluff. It smells really good. This is not my ministry, which is why we're doing a cheater's meringue. So now I'm gonna add the marshmallow fluff and I'm gonna add it slowly about a third at a time so I don't deflate the egg whites. So this is shiny. We have some nice 
stiff peaks, which is exactly what you want. I'm gonna take large chunks, pile it very, very, very high. And then I'm just gonna create like some little hills and valleys, some nice peaks. So I'm gonna go put this in the oven at 350 degrees for about 10 to 12 minutes just to get it brown. We don't have money for a whole turkey. There's also only six guests coming to this dinner. So I'm gonna use a turkey breast. I got it pre-seasoned, which saved me a ton of money on spice. I won't say I don't trust that they fully seasoned it, but I will say don't judge me or this turkey. So I'm just gonna give it a little extra. So now I'm gonna sear the skin side first in an already very, very hot pan. So inside this pan, I already have two tablespoons of olive oil. And what you're looking for is just a nice, golden brown, delicious, crispy, crispy, crispy skin. Make sure the meat is nice and dry before it goes in your pan. This is what we are looking for. Crispy skin, golden brown, delicious. So now I'm gonna add my aromatics to the pan. This will help us out a lot later. So I have three celery stalks that I cut into thirds half of one large yellow onion, and six garlic cloves peeled. So I'm gonna take this guy to the oven at 350 for about 75 minutes until he gets to about 165 degrees. But don't worry, our turkey's not gonna be dry. I'm gonna baste it in its own juices about every 30 minutes or so. So we're gonna keep her nice and moist and ready to go. And now we're gonna get into my favorite part and my whole reason for going to Thanksgiving, the sides. So the first thing I'm gonna make is this cornbread dressing. So the first thing I'm gonna do is cook eight ounces of pork sausage in this pan. I already have it hot, I've added some olive oil to it, so I'm just gonna start here. My pork sausage also has some spice to it, which is a good way to, again, save money on seasoning, but get a little extra flavor. So I'm gonna cook this sausage for about seven to eight minutes just until I get it nice and brown and caramelized. You want it cooked, all the way because it'll give us a lot of texture. Okay, so now I'm gonna add in my celery, that same onion we used earlier, and two garlic cloves that we just minced up. And we're just gonna cook this until the veg gets soft and everything starts to smell really good. I'm also gonna salt this just a tad as we're moving through it, really kick up that spicy flavor that's in our sausage. So my vegetables are all soft, and now I'm gonna add my box cornbread stuffing. Normally, I would make this myself. I'd make my cornbread first. It would be a whole thing, but I had $30, and we don't have that much time. Okay, this is looking pretty good, so now I'm going to add a cup and a half of boiling water and four tablespoons of butter. See? I told y'all we was gonna make it taste good. So now I'm gonna cover this for about five minutes and let it fluff up and absorb all of that butter we just put in. Okay, this is actually surprisingly smelling pretty good. I'm really impressed with this. The one thing dressing and stuffing both have in common is a nice crispy topping. So I'm gonna move this from the stove top to an oven safe casserole dish, and I'm gonna broil it for about one to two minutes just to give it a little crunch. All right, so next I am going to make mashed potatoes. The craziest thing about this entire dish is that I got 10 pounds of mashed potatoes for $1.98. And I'm only using about four pounds of potatoes. So after you cook for everybody and your guest leaves, you make you some mashed potatoes for the next day. I'm gonna use a mandolin because it's faster, but if this scares you, which it should if you're not used to using it, you can absolutely use a knife. The best way to cook these is to cut them very, very thin. So I'm just gonna slice this entire bowl and then we're gonna move on to boiling them. So you always wanna start your potatoes off in cold water. And I'm just gonna salt the water and I'm gonna turn this up. All right, so my potatoes are cooked, they are strained, and now it is time to turn them into mashed potatoes. If you don't have a rice fair, you can use a potato masher. It's nothing wrong with a little rustic potato. You could mash them with a fork, just whatever you have on hand. But these are fancy, so I'm going to use this ricer. So another great money saving tip, sour cream. Typically I would add like, heavy cream or a buttermilk, something to give you that tang and the smooth mouthfeel you get from dairy. We don't have money for that, y'all. I have a cup and a half of melted, but yes, a cup and a half, it's Thanksgiving, of melted butter, and I'm going to add that to my potatoes. I really like doing it by hand because you get to see it come together, and you just, you cook it with a little bit of love. Okay, so this looks really good. We have turkey, we have sweet potatoes, and honestly, I think we need some vegetables. So I'm gonna move on to making us some green beans. So the first thing we're gonna do 
is take three cloves of smashed garlic and we're gonna saute them in our pan with the green beans. So I'm just gonna hit them with a little salt and then I'm actually going to steam them in this chicken stock, which is a great way to add a lot of flavor. You don't wanna steam them till they're very soft. You want them to still have a little bit of bite. So my green beans look good, they're nice and tender. For the ooh la la part, I'm going to zest one entire lemon and you wanna do this at the end because you don't want them to get brown. You want them to keep that bright, vibrant green color. If you feel like you have a firmer lemon, a good tip is just to give it a little roll and add the lemon juice. These guys are looking good. Just give them a little toss, and I'm gonna hit them with a little bit of salt. I think we're ready to go. Okay, last thing we're gonna make is the gravy. So I have one cup of my turkey drippings and water. Basically, drippings are just all those juices we were basing the turkey in and all of those yummy smells from our aromatics, all of that, and then this dripping, which is going to make this gravy tastes like we really put some effort into it. So we're literally going to boil them, boil out the water, boil out anything we don't need, and everything that's left is gonna be very highly concentrated. It's gonna be thick, rich. I think my gravy's good. One thing I like to do is put a little spoon in it. If it coats the back of your spoon, it will coat your meat, which means you are all good to go. All right, this gravy is done. I'm gonna go plate everything, and we're gonna see if it actually tastes good or if it tastes like I spent $30. So let's go try it. This is what $29.93 worth of food looks like. I was able to make the mashed potatoes with real butter and sour cream, so I got that tang, I got my dairy in there. I was able to make this stuffing, which is surprisingly really, really, really beautiful. And we got a nice crunch to it, it looks good, it looks like it took us a lot of time. Green beans, just to liven up the party, we needed some freshness, y'all. We have to eat some vegetables in this pot. Do y'all see? Do y'all see this pie? This pie is stunning. It looks like I actually really, really took my time. And as far as my guests know, I did. Surprisingly, I actually had enough money to add a little bit of cranberry sauce, and I just added some orange zest to it to give it an extra oomph. All right, so I got my plate. It's quality control time, so I'm gonna give this turkey a try. Okay, you guys, this is not bad. Like, for the price point, this is actually pretty good. I'm gonna try my mashed potatoes. Okay, those are amazing. Anything with a cup and a half of butter in it should be amazing, and it is. I'm very proud of this. What's up, everybody? I'm David, and you know I love to cook, but only on a budget. So today, I'm gonna try to make a dollar dish picnic for two for only $14. Everybody, this is the haul. Looks pretty good to me. We've uh, got a wide variety of stuff to make an amazing summer picnic here. We actually came in under budget. While we were looking to spend only $14, we spent $13.37. Now. Along with all of this, we're gonna use some of our pantry staples today. We're gonna use flour, sugar, olive oil, salt, and pepper. Now, I'm really excited to get to it, so let's go ahead and jump into the first recipe. All right, so to get started, we're gonna make a fresh corn salad. Now this is a great addition to have because corn is inexpensive, it's in season right now, and it's a nice, delicious, hearty side to have. Now the first thing we're gonna do is pickle some onions. We're gonna do that with a little bit of olive oil, some lemon juice, a little bit of salt, real quick, just a little half one, and then of course some sugar in there. The pickling of the onions is gonna do two things for us. Take out a little bit of that bite, because it can be a little strong, so that it just blends better with everything, in case you don't like that. And we didn't have enough money to buy vinegar, so it's gonna help us make a little salad dressing as well. All right, this is looking pretty good. And the next thing we're gonna do is boil our corn. So we're gonna bring some salted water to a boil, and place the corn in there for just about five minutes. Some people tend to overcook their corn, boiling it for 10 or 15 minutes. You can always tell if you've left it in too long, if it starts to wrinkle. Now, you can eat corn raw, so honestly, all you need is about five or so minutes and you'll be good to go. All right, now that our corn's finished boiling, we're gonna go ahead and cut it and prep it to go into our salad. You also wanna make sure that you don't handle them until they're cool to the touch, so you don't burn yourself. Typically, when people cut corn, you'll see them stand it up like this, but I'm gonna recommend that you go ahead and just lay it on its side, and the paper towel will help you keep it stabilized, and it's also gonna help catch those kernels so they don't fly everywhere. Whenever I'm cooking and stuff's flying everywhere, it gets on my nerves. I know you probably feel the same. So, you're gonna go ahead and just very carefully cut down the sides. And if we're lucky, we'll get some nice little pieces like this that we can put into our bowl. Now that the corn's done, we'll add some fresh tomatoes. Even got a little avocado on the budget. You know I'm gonna look out for you. Our pickled onions, 
We'll add a little bit of salt, a little pepper. Now mix all that together and then transfer it into a bowl for a backyard picnic or Tupperware so you can have it on the go. We're just going to drizzle a little bit of olive oil on there. Put a nice little paya paya or the salt on there. And of course, you get a little fresh ground pepper. And that is our fresh tomato corn salad. It's colorful, filling, and refreshing. Now it's time to spice things up. Let's go ahead and move on to our main course. And now I'm going to make a spicy fried chicken. It's a delicious, hearty addition. It travels well and is delicious at room temp. We're going to go ahead and get started with a nice two-ingredient marinade here. I'm going to take my hot sauce and put it into the sour cream. And then I'm just going to whisk it together. Now we're going to use sour cream instead of buttermilk because it's a little bit cheaper. And it's still going to give us that nice little tang. Now that that's mixed together, we're going to go ahead and season our chicken. You're going to take a little bit of salt. We're using chicken thighs with the bone in as well as having the skin on because that's going to be a little bit cheaper. And the dark meat always provides a really nice flavor. And a little bit of pepper for these. Now that we've got these all seasoned, we're going to go ahead and transfer them into our marinade. Make sure you get every piece nicely coated. I'm going to go ahead and cover this with some plastic wrap and let it marinate in the fridge for about one to two hours. If you have more time, you can let it marinate overnight. Now it's time to fry some chicken. So as you can see, we've got our marinated chicken that we were working on earlier and a little bit of flour. Now sometimes you want to add a little kick, but you don't have all the money to get all the various spices you'll need. So we found a seasoning packet. This one's a buffalo flavor to add just a little bit more heat, a little bit of a kick to it. So what we're going to do is tear that open and put just a little bit to the side, you know, about a teaspoon or something, because we want to use that later so that we can garnish our chicken. And go ahead and put the rest of it into your flour and you're going to mix that up. I'm going to go ahead and take these beautiful chicken thighs. You're going to put them directly into your flour. You want to dredge them in the flour and make sure that they get evenly coated directly from that flour. Carefully place it into the oil. As you can see, we've got a cast iron skillet. That's going to allow us to do a shallow fry, save a little bit more of the oil we bought, and that retains heat amazingly, works really well, and we're going to get a really nice crisp on our chicken. We've heated up our oil to about 350 or so degrees, and we're going to let these bad boys fry. We're only gonna do about two at a time here because we wanna make sure we don't crowd the pan. Because if you add too much chicken, you're not gonna have enough time to cook evenly and give you that nice crisp that you're looking for. All right, now that we're finished, we're gonna go ahead and let these drain on a paper towel. And while they're still hot, we're gonna use that leftover seasoning we had and go ahead and garnish with a little bit of that. We're gonna go ahead and place these in a little basket, put them in a box, whatever's clever. And with that, we have our flavorful spicy fried chicken. Now let's end things on a sweet note with dessert. Today, we're gonna make some strawberry shortcake jars. And strawberry shortcake is refreshing, and I mean, why not? So I got lucky and found these mini biscuits for only a dollar, which is perfect because that's all I really need for the two of us. We'll go ahead, open it up. It's my favorite part. And we've got a baking sheet lined with parchment paper to help us to make sure they don't stick when we take them out. We're just gonna put these into the oven and follow the directions on the can. It says about 400 degrees for eight to 11 minutes or until they're nice and golden brown on the top. Let's go pop these in the oven. Now, another reason we're making strawberry shortcake is that we found these strawberries on sale for only $1.56 for an entire pound. Now, I wanna show you a little trick that we use when we prepped our strawberries. If you can take a metal straw like this and insert it through the bottom, then the stem just pops right out. If you have a little excess, that's all right. Just tear it off and then you'll chop it and throw it in there with the rest. We wanna make sure to drizzle with just a little bit of sugar to make it a little sweet and it's gonna bring out the juices in the strawberries. So when we add it to our jar, it'll make a nice little strawberry syrup for those biscuits to soak up. All right, our biscuits are ready. First, we're gonna chop up these biscuits. Now, I recommend taking it and kinda of trying to cut it in half first, then laying it flat, cutting across, spinning it one more time, and that'll give you some nice little bite-sized cubes. Throw those into a bowl. We've got these really cool glass jars, which are gonna be perfect for after we assemble everything so you can see all the beautiful layers. Now you're gonna start out with your chopped biscuits, then we'll add our strawberries. You wanna try to work from the outside layer in, and then we're gonna add the whipped cream. Now, you don't have to use a piping bag, but I think it's kinda cool, pretty easy, and I wanted to feel fancy. So we'll just squeeze that in there. It's a little bit messy, so I'm just gonna smooth that out. We're gonna go ahead and add some more of our biscuits. And for me, it doesn't have to look pretty, as long as it tastes good. Some more of our fresh strawberries on there. We'll end with our whipped topping. We're gonna put just a little bit of our biscuits on top as a little garnish and a nice little strawberry on the side. 
Now these strawberry shortcake jars actually get even better the longer they sit because that strawberry syrup is just gonna sop and soak into those biscuits and make it even more amazing. It's the perfect picnic dessert because they look, taste, and smell just like summer. Well everyone, this is our dollar dish picnic for two and we were able to execute it for under $14. We've got a fresh corn tomato salad, we've got some delicious spicy fried chicken, and our strawberry shortcake jar. Now, uh, before I go, I gotta make sure and do some quality control. Let's see how this came out. Now, that's good. That extra little seasoning on top gave it the perfect little kick. I gotta wrap all this up, take it home. Me and Amanda are gonna have a backyard picnic. <laughs> As you can see, I've already went shopping and we got some pretty good deals here. Now, I did go a little bit over budget, but I think we still did pretty good. The total only came out to $20.43. As always, we're gonna use a few of our pantry freebies. Today, we're gonna be using olive oil, sugar, salt, and pepper. Well, with that, let's get started. Now, we're gonna start with this pineapple barbecue bacon burger. Now, these are gonna be pretty epic. I mean, it's wrapped in bacon and stuffed with cheese. What more could you want? The first step is gonna be to take your ground beef and just season it to taste with a little salt. Maybe about one and a half pie or something like that. You know, nothing crazy. And do the same with your pepper. Make sure that you use enough since this is gonna be for all four burgers. Now, we're gonna go ahead and start to incorporate this seasoning together. Just use your hands and work it in really good. And then we'll put in about a cup of barbecue sauce. Want to make sure we get all of that in there. Now we chose burgers because ground beef tends to be a little bit cheaper and it's always a fan favorite. And when you stuff it with cheese, everybody's gonna be happy. Now, after you've got your meat ready, you want to go ahead and section it off into about four pieces so that you can have four big juicy burgers. They're gonna be big. We ain't gonna give you that little fast food burger you be having at your cousin barbecue, you go home hungry. Don't nobody like that. Now after you get it worked into a nice little ball, we'll place it onto our baking sheet. So then, you can use a soda can or beer can, whatever you have around the house, to help you make that little crater where we'll fill our cheese. So I'm gonna go ahead and just smash it down in there. And you wanna make sure that you try to build it up around the sides so that you don't have any cracks in it. And then we'll take our bacon. You wanna go ahead and just slide that around. It's gonna get to bubbling and, and, and bacon in all over the place. Now, you know we're generous here, so we're gonna use two strips, wrap that around. And now, once you've got it all nice and wrapped, you wanna take a toothpick and just insert it wherever the bacon overlaps so that it'll stay together as it cooks. So one right there, then I'm gonna put another one on the other side, and maybe one more over here just to be safe. And then you can lift out your can, and you should have a nice little crater for your cheese. Now, we decided to get a block of cheddar cheese and cut it ourselves, rather than getting some shredded cheese or pre-cut cheese because it's a little cheaper. We're just gonna repeat that step three more times and we'll be ready to put these bad boys on the grill. I've got my burgers ready. I've got my pineapple slices. I was lucky enough to find a fresh pineapple. Went ahead and cut it into four slices so we have one for each burger and now we're ready to go. Let's get these on the grill. So we've got our grill up to about 375 degrees. I'm gonna place these burgers over indirect heat. Now what that means is we've got this left side of the grill turned off and the right side, we have both burners on. So when we close it, it's gonna act just like an oven, but still give you that nice charred flavor that we're looking for. All right. We're gonna baste these with the barbecue sauce every 10 to 15 minutes. You wanna go ahead and just drizzle, dabble, and just let that flavor get in there as it caramelizes and cooks really nice. And now we're gonna place our pineapples over direct heat. We've used a little paper towel just to remove some of the excess water to make sure we get some really nice grill marks. Mmm, already smells good. And we'll just let these pineapple slices cook for about one to two minutes per side until we have some nice grill marks. I'm basting these for the second time. These guys are looking good. Now let's go prep our sides. Now I know, when you're thinking hamburgers, you're thinking fries, but I wanted to put just a little bit of a healthy spin on it. Besides, string beans are pretty much the French fries of vegetables, so we've got some string beans and some potato wedges we're gonna put together. Now to get started with our potato wedges, you're just gonna take your potato, already peeled, put it up on its side like this, and cut it down the middle. Now you can take that and just cut it into some nice sized wedges, like so. Now we're gonna take those wedges and place them into our bowl. Now, when you're on a budget, salt and pepper your friend. Don't be all fancy trying to get the pink Himalayan and all that. This, you know, nice sea salt does just fine. And today I'm excited because we got garlic Parmesan. That's my favorite thing to put on wings and all types of things. Now, I'm gonna be generous with this one because I like it. Go ahead and get that well up in there. Now, just make sure you get everything coated really nicely. The olive oil, salt, pepper, and seasoning so that it grills really nice. We'll do the same with our potato wedges. 
smells amazing already. And with that, I think these are ready for the grill. Now that our burgers have about 15 minutes left, we're gonna go ahead and get our sides on. Now with these potato wedges, we're gonna throw them on the grill for about five to seven minutes per side. That garlic Parmesan seasoning packet is gonna come in perfect. I can already smell the flavor. And now for our green beans. Make sure all your veggies have even contact with the grill. We don't wanna overcrowd it, so if it takes a couple batches, that's fine. We'll cook these potato wedges for about five to seven minutes per side. You'll know they're done once you can see the beautiful grill marks and they're easy to pierce with a fork. Now that our veggies are done, we'll go ahead and get these burgers off the grill and assemble them. All right, it's time to put these burgers together. We're gonna go ahead and start with just a little bit of lettuce on the bottom. And then we'll go ahead and get that delicious burger oozing with cheese. And last but not least, that beautiful charred pineapple. All right, everyone's for sure gonna love these. Now that our burgers are put together, we're gonna go ahead and put our side into a nice little bowl. I've decided to garnish it with a little bit of lemon. Yes, there's a little bit and got one. And we can go ahead and put some fresh lemon juice on the top just for another nice flavor. So at this point, I think I deserve a taste. Let's go ahead and see what we're working with here. Definitely gotta get some of these delicious green beans. And of course, I'm gonna need one of these amazing burgers. All right, this is pretty big, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut it in half so I can actually get a bite out of it. Now that looks like heaven. We were able to find a nice variety of stuff and we're gonna actually make three different menu items today. We're gonna have a cream cheese stuffed monkey bread, a mixed green salad with an orange dressing, as well as a BLT eggs Benedict. Of course, I'll be using a few pantry items. These are things we always keep stocked in the tasty kitchen. Today we'll be using salt, pepper, butter, and oil. I'm excited to dive in, and I hope my friends are gonna be impressed. With that said, let's get cooking. So the first thing we're gonna be making is the cream cheese stuffed monkey bread. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and add a little bit of cinnamon to my sugar here. We'll use this in a bit after we put together our cinnamon rolls and get them ready for the pan. You wanna just kinda of mix that in there so we have that nice light brown color, and we'll put that off to the side for now. Now we're gonna use some cinnamon roll dough today because I wanted to make a super easy and quick dessert to add to my brunch. Gonna go ahead and get it open. Oh, all right, looks like the cinnamon rolls had a little bit of pie out themselves. Now you'll wanna cut them in half so that you have almost a sort of moon shape. Bring these two sides together, flatten it down with your finger until it's basically back into a circle again. And we have about four ounces of cream cheese here that we've cut into some cubes. You'll take one of the small cubes, place it into the center, wrap the cinnamon roll around it, roll it between your hands, and then we'll use that cinnamon sugar that we made earlier. Just kind of toss it in there, make sure it's well covered. Can't forget to get a little pan into our baking dish. Now that that's been greased, we can go ahead and finish covering our cinnamon roll ball and the cinnamon sugar. Drop that in there. You wanna place this to the side and we can make a few more to layer in the pan. Now, we're going to make a bit of a caramel sauce to add to this just to make it a little bit more rich and give it a really nice flavor. And for this, it's super simple. We're just gonna use a little bit of brown sugar and some warm butter. Now you wanna whisk this very well. Try to get all of that butter incorporated into the brown sugar. There's a couple of lumps in there, it's no problem. Just keep on mixing with your whisk until you get a little bit more of a smooth consistency. Now we're gonna pour this over the top and then give us a really nice sweet glaze. That looks good. Now we'll go ahead and pour this over our mixture. Try to get an even pour as much as you can, but again, in the oven, it's gonna caramelize the sugar in there and it'll spread nice throughout. All right, that looks good. We're gonna put this in the oven at 350 for about 35 to 40 minutes. And then when we get back, I'll show you what we're gonna do with the icing that came with our cinnamon rolls. All right guys, our monkey bread is finished and looks amazing. When you take it out of the oven, make sure that you let it sit for about five to 10 minutes or until it's cool to the touch. Then you can invert it onto a plate like this and we'll go ahead and get started with our icing. Now, another tip would be the reason that we use that cinnamon roll is because it comes with an icing of its own. So we're gonna just spoon this into a small microwave safe dish Warm it up for about 30 seconds or so, and we're gonna drizzle it along the top for, again, another piece of nice presentation. So since we had two cans, we've got plenty of icing for this monkey bread. I will make sure that I get every last drop because this is dollar dish, and we will make sure that we get our money's worth. A little bit of frosting trying to hide from it. We're just gonna scrape him out. All right. I've got all of the icing out. I'm gonna go ahead and microwave it for about 30 seconds, and when I come back, we're gonna drizzle it on top of the monkey bread. All right, now we've got our icing just a little bit more workable, and I'm gonna drizzle this across the monkey bread for our final touch. 
This glaze definitely makes the monkey bread look perfect. It's so indulgent, rich, smells amazing. Now it's probably gonna be a good idea to balance this out with a little salad or something. I'll be right back and we'll get started on that. Next up, we're gonna make a mixed green salad with an orange dressing. We've got two oranges, which are actually gonna be doing double duty. We'll segment them to place on top of the salad and also juice them to make a nice citrusy dressing. So how we're gonna do this is take two small cuts first. You're gonna cut off the top and the bottom. And this will give us a more sturdy workspace. We don't have the orange moving around when you're trying to do a more difficult cutting technique. Now you'll take your knife and place it just under the skin and try to work it down and around. Now I'm not a pro, so don't feel bad if you're not able to make this perfect. We really just wanna to try to make sure that we save as much of the fruit there as possible and just get off all of that peel. Now that we've got our oranges cleaned up, we're gonna go back in with our paring knife and try to cut out these segments. You wanna aim for the space right in between these membranes that you see. Also, it's very important to try to cut angled down at a V from both sides. This way, the segment will free itself. After you get that out, we'll place it into our bowl here to be used later. You can just keep going around and slowly cut those pieces out. This is gonna add a really nice color to our salad and be delicious for our dressing when we juice the rest of it. Now, once you're finished, you wanna take everything that you have left and squeeze it with the juices into your larger bowl because we're gonna use that to make our dressing in a little bit. We're gonna repeat the process with our second orange, get all those wonderful juices in there for our dressing and finish up this salad. All right. Now we've got everything set up here to put together our salad, and we're gonna get started with the dressing. First things first, I'm gonna put this orange juice into a cup. Make sure you use a strainer just in case a few pieces of those segments got in. We're only gonna need about a quarter cup of orange juice here. After that, we're gonna wanna put in our lemon juice and our sugar. And then we'll put this in the microwave for about 60 seconds until the sugar dissolves. All right, now that we've got the sugar dissolved, we're gonna go ahead and mix in our olive oil. Make sure you whisk all of this olive oil in there. Now we'll wanna put just a little pinch of salt. About paya, paya, just two payas this time, not too much. And depending on your taste, a few cracks of pepper, and that should be good to go. Now I'm gonna put these to the side as I assemble the rest of my salad. We wanna make sure to reserve just about a handful of these mixed greens so we can also use them with our BLT Eggs Benedict. Now, I've got some nice avocados here because I mean, what's a brunch in California without avocados? Those segmented oranges that we worked with earlier. Again, just gonna add another beautiful color to this salad. Some red onions for a nice little crunch. That should do it. And last but not least, I've got some nice honey roasted nuts here that we just chopped up. And I found these pretty much in the checkout aisle where you'll see those little grab and go kind of snacks. I think it's just gonna give another nice little sweet flavor to the end of our salad. And again, make it look a little bit more fancy than it is. It's a dollar dish trend right there. I'm not gonna quite put the salad dressing on yet. I wanna make sure that I toss that within the salad right before we plate everything. And now it's time for the last recipe. Everyone's gonna be here soon, so let's make that Eggs Benedict. Now I'm definitely excited to make this BLT Eggs Benedict. To get started, we're gonna go ahead and make our English muffins. We're gonna take this bad boy, slice it in half, and place it onto our pan like so. So we're only actually gonna use three of these and have some extras left over in the package. So you have more to use for meal prep the next week or just to make another meal. That's another one of our dollar dish tips. And now we're gonna move on to the bacon. We're gonna use about two slices for each of our eggs benedict. So you'll wanna take these and just line them across your pan. Now we could have gone with the typical eggs benedict, but we thought that this little addition of the bacon was gonna give it just another nice flavor and our fun little twist that we'll put on a classic brunch dish. And now that we've got them ready, we're gonna bake these in the same oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll put our English muffins in for about five minutes and our bacon in for about 12 to 15 minutes until it's crispy and golden brown. All right, now it's time to poach our eggs. We're gonna be using these eggs here, which are again a staple within our dollar dish meals because eggs are relatively inexpensive, they're filling, and you can use them within a lot of different dishes. Today, we're gonna to use them for the poached egg within our Eggs Benedict, as well as within our hollandaise sauce. Now, since poaching eggs can be difficult, we're gonna teach you a hack using this muffin tin. You can poach a lot of eggs, save a lot of time, and it can be done a lot quicker. Now, the first thing you're gonna do is grease your pan. You wanna make sure that you put a little bit more than you think you'll need, just so that we don't have the egg white sticking to the side of the muffin tin. Now. We're gonna crack our eggs in, but you wanna be very careful because you don't wanna break the yolk. All right, now that we've got our eggs ready, we're gonna add a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. We'll finish off with just a quick six, little paya, 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 paya. And one more, paya. Wanted to be gentle on that one. And now one of the most important parts, 
you're going to add one tablespoon of water to each one of the muffin tins that has your egg. Now you don't wanna just drop the water on top, you wanna to try to spread it out around the entire egg so that it forms that egg bath. And if you have extra, go ahead and put it on top in the middle. Now, we're gonna place these in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about seven to nine minutes or until that egg white is firm and the yolk still has that nice runny texture. All right, now we've got everything ready to assemble our Eggs Benedict. The first thing I'm gonna do is take my English muffins here and add just a little bit of butter on there so it has a nice rich flavor at the base. After that, we're gonna go ahead and add the mixed greens that I reserved from our salad to add a little bit of nice color and flavor to our BLT Eggs Benedict. We got the bacon, the lettuce, the tomato. I gotta put the L in my BLT Eggs Benedict. Now that L stands for both love and lettuce. Just kind of distribute those evenly. It doesn't have to be a whole bunch on any one of them. Now we're gonna put the tomato. This will act as a nice little surface for our bacon and our egg. Now for the bacon, we'll take these and just kind of break them in half so that we can fit them on a little bit nicer. And you'll take two pieces for every Eggs Benedict. Now we're ready for the egg. You're gonna wanna tip it over a little to try to let some of that water bath run off and place it on top. All right, last one. The pressure is on. Careful. Ooh, that was close. All right, now we're gonna put together our hollandaise sauce. Seems simple, but you wanna make sure that you're careful as you put this together. We're gonna start with a few egg yolks in our blender and then we'll add our lemon juice and you wanna blend this for about a minute or so until you see a pale yellow color. Now that we've got the eggs nice and ready, we're gonna go ahead and start to add this melted butter. Now you wanna very slowly pour this in as it continues to blend. Now we're talking very slow. The heat of the blender in the butter will help to cook those eggs and finish off our sauce. And now that it's almost together, we'll add just a pinch of salt for taste. And that looks perfect. Now you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you pour this on and serve it immediately. It's gonna have a nice, thick texture, and you just wanna put a nice, generous serving on each one. It adds a really nice, beautiful shine to the top as well, which you're always looking for when you make that Eggs Benedict. And we're just about ready for my friends to come try this out. Now, a lot of times people will top this off with some fresh chives or some paprika, but that's not in the dollar dish budget. So we're just gonna crack a little bit of our free pantry item pepper on here. All right, my friends will be here any minute, so I've gotta get everything else ready so they can try this wonderful brunch. All right, well, I've gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with what we've been able to put together here for only $20. Everything's ready. We've got this decadent cream cheese filled monkey bread, this wonderful mixed green salad with a nice orange dressing, and our BLT Eggs Benedict. And two of my friends showed up a little early, so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and see what they think. Hello. What's up, Ooh, guys? How you, you doing? You're cooking, cooking. I mean, this I'm trying is... to do my thing, you know. This How you doing? Really? Good. It's good to this see is, you. This is a spread. Wow, it's I beautiful. Mean, yeah, I thought it was going to be like two egg McMuffins or something. This nah, is... nah, we really try to go hard on Dollar Dish, you know. Day. You look good. Yeah. Let me stop talking and just let you guys try it. Yeah. I feel like cool. this needs to be like a, a holiday or something. Let's eat. How you feeling? Mm. I like how when it's, when you could taste fresh things, how it just like explodes in your mouth. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's a party going on All right now. All those flavors. Let me hop into this BLT though. I'm gonna go ahead. 